Um, thanks, yeah, again very much to Marta and others for organizing this. It's very good to be back in Barcelona and great to see the Smells Project sort of starting again or <laughs> restarting or... <laughs> um, I have to also apologize because um, there are going to be some unpleasant sorts of um, aesthetic concepts thrown out there and, ex and unpleasant examples and it's not ideal to be just before lunch, but uh, hopefully you'll forgive me. <laughs> Um, I have tried to, I have, the images aren't too bad, so, and I don't have any smells to give you, like Larry. <coughs> okay, so although interest in the non-visual senses and their objects uh, in aesthetics has been increasing, smells considered apart from gustatory tastes are often ignored. My talk explores smells and negative aesthetics, that is, smells in more difficult or negatively valenced aesthetic experiences from the sublime to the ugly in everyday life and natural environments. My central question will be, uh, uh, are bad smells ugly, disgusting, or sublime? Which of these categories do bad smells fit into? Um, and to really explore uh, these different kinds of negative aesthetic categories in relation to smells in particular. To answer these questions, I'll begin by summarizing discussions that smells can in fact be aesthetic objects, legitimate aesthetic objects, contrary to the claim that they are too unstable for aesthetic attention. I'll, sh I'll show that this is true even in situations not involving connoisseurship, that is, within everyday aesthetic contexts. Uh, and in these aesthetic, everyday aesthetic contexts, I'll contend that smells have real significance for us. Um, bad smells will be my focus, but pleasant smells too. I then move on to examine the ways in which unpleasant smells are aesthetically appreciated. Um, I contend that bad smells are best fitted to the category of ugliness or to the neighboring category of disgust, and I consider the relationship between these two kinds of disvalue. I also argue that smells cannot be sublime because even overwhelming ones fail to exhibit the characteristics of paradigm cases of the sublime. In reflecting on these issues, I hope to also address a couple debates in aesthetics. First, the way in which aesthetics has been expanding into the non-arts, and to try to show or lend more support to cases that have been made for smells as proper aesthetic objects, but also to contribute something to new discussions on negative aesthetics, specifically distinctions uh, that can be made between ugliness, disgust, and sublimity. Okay, so what are we talking about when we're talking about bad smells? Well, I did a trawl of the internet, and this, this seems to be sort of the, the list, the top list of the most kind of unpleasant smells that people find the most unpleasant. Um, I don't know if this is culturally specific uh, or so universal in some sense, but I think at least in this audience we can certainly recognize these. I would also say that um, that this list is, is on the sort of really strong end of bad smells. Uh, certainly smells that could be considered disgusting and repulsive. It's important to remember that bad smells that will range from sort of weakly unpleasant to very strongly unpleasant and disgusting. So perhaps some examples of less, un uh, less disgusting or less unpleasant smells would be um, the smell of something bitter, some kinds of cheese for some people, uh, exhaust and pollution, um, blood, urine, again, the degrees, I think, of, of uh, unpleasantness <coughs> here, um, repulsion being at the quite strong end, um, uh, the smell of meat cooking for some is very pleasant, for others it it's, uh, can, can verge on repulsive and disgusting, cigarette smoke, again, for many people is unpleasant, um, gasoline was mentioned, and I. I also found um, from Larry's talk some good examples that I was jotting down, like burnt rubber and gasoline. Okay, so this is the subject matter. Um, some, some bad fish at the bottom, and that's a type of corpse flower um, on the top. I've never, has anyone ever smelled a corpse flower? I, ha I haven't either, but I'm sure they exist in, in some botanical gardens to be sought out. Okay, so as I said, I just wanted to summarize. I've, I've written an earlier paper on smells, and there I go through more carefully uh, why I think smells can be legitimate <clears throat> aesthetic objects. And I'm just going to really summarize the, the against and for um, debate here. 
Uh, historically, smells have been relegated to the lower or baser pleasures, like tastes, tastes and smells, associated with the body. And as such, they've been considered not proper um, forms of aesthetic sensibility. They've also been associated, both smells and tastes, with consumption, uh, with eating, and as such, or drinking, and as such, um, have been um, uh, excluded from the realm of aesthetic uh, objects because they're seen not to be the objects of aesthetic attention, in particular because of the tradition of disinterestedness, which argues for uh, aesthetic appreciation as, as focusing on an object's qualities for their own sake. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> and um, also that, that uh, smells have been claimed to be too unstable or transient to be proper aesthetic objects. And here, really, just think about the typical kinds of uh, aesthetic objects, or the kind of common, commonly <coughs> referenced aesthetic objects, such as artworks that are permanently shown in galleries. Of course, there are lots of exceptions to that, but if you want to think of a, uh, the permanence of artworks uh, and the impermanence of smells, you can see quite a great uh, contrast. But again, sort of quickly trying to defend smells, or at least just summarize debates that have been made elsewhere. Um, smells uh, certainly can be analyzed as complex aesthetic objects. They can be the subject of non-instrumental aesthetic appreciation. Uh, you don't have to be a connoisseur to simply appreciate the different flavors and tastes and smells in a meal before you actually consume it and to try to do so in a way that's disinterested. Uh, and uh, Certainly, smells have uh, a kind of instability to them, a kind of impermanence that we wouldn't associate with a painting on a wall or indeed a sculpture. Um, they have a kind of ephemerality, uh, but uh, this does not make them less appreciable. Uh, it make, may make them more challenging to appreciate, and certainly we have, uh, you know, the olfactory vocabulary <coughs> can be very rich, but um, it is perhaps uh, more difficult. When I was trying to come up with some descriptions of bad smells, I found it much more challenging than, of course, if I was relying on terms related to visual qualities, of visual aesthetic qualities. Um, and here, a, a defense <coughs> is um, brought in from environmental aesthetics. So environmental aesthetics involves many kinds of aesthetic objects, which are more ephemeral, more transient, um, such as weather. Um, so, and, and uh, environmental statisticians have made, I think, pretty strong arguments for the um, inclusion of, of certain kinds of, of uh, dynamic aspects of the environment as aesthetically appreciable. And finally, a connoisseurship, I think, is, you know, as we've seen, you know, from Larry's talk, and uh, I'm sure that we'll see in some of the other talks, that connoisseurship is really uh, where we can turn to for talking about the complexity and structure of aroma and smells. Um, and the kinds of aesthetic uh, terminology and aesthetic concepts that can be applied, a kind of appreciative context, and so on, which can establish smells as proper aesthetic objects. Now, um, I think that bad smells can add, I'm not sure if a new dimension is quite the way uh, to put it, um, but can add something to thinking about the debate, the debate that, that has already been going on, really, about the inclusion or exclusion of smells as aesthetic objects and what makes them different or unusual or interesting as aesthetic objects. Um, so with bad smells, I think we have to remember that although they also meet the requirements of aesthetic objects, I believe, we may be less inclined in experience to dwell on them. But it will be possible, certainly, except perhaps for the most disgusting or repulsive smells which may cause such a visceral or bodily reaction, nausea, and so on, that we may have to hold our nose or simply exit <laughs> the experience in some way. Um, I'm not sure about this, but I think connoisseurship is probably less relevant to bad smells, although I think Larry's example, you know, that was an art example, not really a perfumery example, but it's possible um, that connoisseurship is probably less relevant. Of course, that doesn't mean that of connoisseurs are not discerning between more pleasant and less pleasant smells, but I suspect that connoisseurship is often directed more toward the positive or the pleasant, uh, positive aesthetic value. So I'm not sure about that, but 
think it, it may be. I'd be interested to see if there are some examples which show that not to be the case. Um, and so I think, I do think that trying to reflect on the nature of bad smells, even if we are perhaps less inclined to focus on them and discern different aspects of a bad smell, we can still uh, theoretically think about uh, how it is that bad smells can lend more support to the claim that smells are proper aesthetic objects. What's also interesting is that uh, aesthetic uh, bad smells, if they perhaps have less of a role in connoisseurship, can perhaps lend more <coughs> support to the relevance and interest and place of smells, bad smells, in everyday aesthetics. Uh, many of the kinds of examples I'm going to talk about don't have any intentionality behind them. They are just part of the environment. Um, intentionality, at least in terms of being uh, created as aesthetic objects, uh, whether it be perfume or you know, in terms of pleasant aesthetic objects. We're talking about exhaust or diesel fumes in, in an urban setting or uh, coal smoke in a rural setting or whatever. Um, so I, I do want to try to focus here on uh, the role of, of bad smells in everyday aesthetics and to think about um, what they can offer to thinking about smells more generally outside of the arts. Okay. Uh, any attempt, <clears throat> as I see it, to understand the place of smells in aesthetics needs to address the nature of their appreciation outside the more specialized context of connoisseurship. Since I first tackled this topic, uh, the earlier paper I mentioned, philosophical aesthetics has broadened its scope more and more beyond its traditional concern for art, with growing interest, of course, in everyday and environmental aesthetics. And discussions in both areas are especially important for understanding how experiences that fall into the aesthetic domain extend beyond the narrower boundaries set by artistic aesthetics, traditional ideas of aesthetic experience, and the prejudice, prejudices which accompany these views. Some uh, philosophers writing in everyday and environmental aesthetics argue that a new starting point, a whole new starting point, is needed when thinking through the domain of the aesthetic. So, you know, back in the 1950s, Frank Sibley was really important, I think, for um, looking at a wide range of aesthetic subject matter outside the arts. And more recently, uh, in the last 20 or 30 years, Arnold Berliant's work has called for an entirely new starting point, um, the aesthetic field, not the arts, and for thinking about aesthetics as engagement. Um, so I, I do think in this respect that uh, uh, thinking about smells can add something to understanding the range of experiences that we have in relation to the non-arts. Now to go on to think about bad smells in everyday aesthetics, I just wanted to uh, present some interesting work by uh, Sherry Irvin, which is just generally about uh, everyday aesthetics and uh, its sort of legitimacy as aesthetic experience. She has a lovely quote here. Um, I drink tea out of a large mug that is roughly egg-shaped, and I clasp it with both hands to warm my palms. When I'm petting my cat, I crouch over his body so that I can smell his fur, which at different places smells like trapped sunshine or roasted nuts, a bit like almonds, but not quite. This, of course, is a very pleasant experience, you know, drinking a cup of tea, some sunlight, uh, lovely smells. Um, and for those of you who have cats, I'm sure you have had experiences of, of smelling your cat. And, and cats have different smells. Sometimes they are mixed with more unpleasant smells. But often, at least with my cat, it's just a kind of musky, musky smell, depending on, on uh, where she's lately been. So. <laughs> but um, thinking about smells in everyday aesthetics, um, some of Urban's discussion, which I, I just wanted to sort of integrate and think about in relation to bad smells, relates to John Dewey's art as experience, um, which in, in these sort of in more recent times offers one of the more generous treatments of everyday aesthetics. Uh, by using some of Dewey's work, Urban shows how these kinds of ordinary experiences, like having a cup of tea and um, drinking, uh, smelling her cat, meet his rough, quite rough aesthetic criteria of conscious awareness, unity, closure, and complexity. Irvin's <coughs> argument hinges on the view that although qualitatively different, these kinds of experiences nonetheless belong in the aesthetic domain. At the same time, she challenges his criteria, going further to show how, although such experiences may be simple, lacking in unity or closure, or characterized by limited or fragmented awareness, aesthetic concepts are nonetheless applicable. <coughs> 
consider the smell of one's own vomit. Unity and closure are possible here, as the aromas associated with red wine mixed with the previous night's meal come together. There is sensory engagement with an aesthetic object combined with thoughts about the object we're focusing on, or rather the aesthetic object imposing itself upon us. Though we may not choose to dwell on the odor and visual aspects of it, it nonetheless can become the focus of our attention. And again, I'm not assuming that one has the capacity to do a lot of focused attention here, but I'm, I'm simply trying to, in a sense, unpack what may be a fairly brief kind of um, response. Two different smells can also come together to create a unitary smell that may be held together spatially and psychologically. Uh, the smell of a musty or mildewed house interior combined with the scent of old wooden floors, for example. This may form a complex yet whole smell in our memories and one that easily comes back to us in some form through recollection. This is actually exactly the smell of my mother's house, which I spent a lot of time in in April um, because she's no longer living there, but going through a lot of old things. And, and uh, we spent a long time trying to get the smell out of the house in various kinds of ways. Uh, and it, it was an incredibly um, pungent a smell that had a mixture of sort of memories for me, but also <coughs> on unpleasant list because it, it just had got um, to a point where it wasn't very nice anymore for someone who wasn't used to it. Many everyday smells and tastes exhibit simpli simplicity and fragmentation. Simplicity is often admired as an aesthetic quality in objects, and it is a style favored by many chefs in their approach to food. Some bad smells are distinctive for their simplicity and directness. And I had a little bit of a hard time finding examples here because I think many smells that seem simple are often complex, but I think bitterness is one that could be described as a kind of simple smell. Um, now, in terms of thinking about um, fragmentation, I want to work with both pleasant and unpleasant smells here. So imagine walking through a forest. Um, this can lack unity if it's comprised of several distinct varying kinds of experiences. A a uh, fresh smell of pine in the background, catching sight of a chipmunk scampering away, the bright sound of bird song. Meals can also, of course, be like this, um, attending and sa savoring different kinds of flavors. The experience can be fragmented in certain kinds of ways, but it can also perhaps come together in certain ways. Um, there are many ways in which aesthetic responses can play out, and I think the fragmentation point uh, is one that can play out in different kinds of contexts. So if we're out in the countryside, imagine the a smell of manure, um, when manure is being spread on the fields, and you often get a kind of vague, vague smell in the countryside. It's not up close, but it's a little bit more vague. Uh, mixed up with that manure smell, which is quite sour and uh, old, uh, pungent odor, we might have a more pleasant, fresh smell of, of grass. So that smell could drift in and out of the experience, and in a sense, um, different kinds of awareness uh, could be focused, could be focusing on the manure, the grass could come in. So there's a kind of interruptions of, of one smell by other smells, a kind of layering and so on. So if we think of these experiences fragmented in a way, there's a sense in which still we're having uh, aesthetic experiences which are quite meaningful or they have some kind of impact, they aren't uh, uh, meaningless or insignificant or trivial or minor in any way. And certainly I think it's worth remembering that in the arts there are many many artworks that intend to create fragmented experiences uh, for the viewer. So again I think that the idea of, of experiences being fragmented doesn't have to go against uh, the notion of bad smells or any other kinds of smells as somehow not being the objects of aesthetic experience. Dewey was also very interested in the connections between aesthetics and lived experience. Life, how does aesthetics feed into life more generally? What is its significance? Um, now in terms of pleasant smells, we can talk about uh, the way in which great satisfaction is gained from both smells, you know, very pleasant, um, satisfying smells and tastes, such as the fragrance of, of jasmine. Um, we could talk about pleasant smells and tastes, too, as uh, contributing to the good life. But there are um, 
ways in which uh, strange smells and, and bad smells are also significant to, to life um, in ways that are not about pleasure, uh, but in other kinds of ways. And <clears throat> we can talk about this um, uh, on various levels. Um, I like this quote. I can't remember what, how I was, what I was searching for, but I came, came to this interesting quote, a virgin, uh, a very interesting story. A virgin Australia flight from Melbourne to Sydney was forced to turn back to the airport 10 minutes into the flight after cabin crew detected a bad odor. Um, so that's really just illustrating ways in which bad smells, bad odors, um, can signify uh, usually bad kinds of things or problematic kinds of things in our <coughs> environment. Um, there are ways in which they contribute to uh, understanding our environment. And through aesthetic means, insofar as we can focus on bad smells from an aesthetic perspective. Uh, where vision tends to distance us from our surroundings, smell, uh, so smelling involves the body integrated with the environment, that is through the nose. As our olfactory sense environs us, it also enables the discovery of meaning in places and situations uh, where we find ourselves. Through a particular kind of aesthetic orientation, we can interpret and understand and adjust our values in relation to our environments. Um, and in these kinds of contexts, we can talk about bad smells as being, uh, I'm not sure if educative is quite the word, edifying is sometimes a term that's used around negative aesthetics like tragedy, where you have very difficult, challenging uh, kinds of aesthetic experiences that can somehow edify, uh, expand our emotional range, enable us to cope better. So I'm suggesting here that bad smells can have a significance along those kinds of lines. Um, they can, you know, in very concrete ways, indicate to us danger, uh, such as disease and other kinds of problems. So while they are bad smells, forms of aesthetic disvalue, they can still have a kind of significance in our lives that's not attached to simply the gaining of pleasure or satisfaction. Um, familiar and recognizable smells um, can be very key, too, to habituating us um, in environments. So while they, uh, when we're talking about unpleasant smells, um, <clears throat> there's still a kind of habituating effect that I would argue. Um, the smells associated with a particular house, often of food, can become so familiar that they become part of the background so that we become only vaguely aware of them. So like my mother's house, it was unpleasant, but it was something that I still associated with a place that I visited to see her. Uh, certain houses, I think, um, will have certain kinds of uh, food smells that linger um, quite, you know, for a long time and are sort of become part of the background. But unfamiliarity uh, is also, oops, too far ahead now, unfamiliarity is also significant, um, plays an, a significant role here, not just a familiarity and habituation. Uh, as I said, bad smells can alert us to, to what's strange, to what's dangerous. They can make us feel alien and fearful. Um, some places will have unrecognizable smells, and that will create uh, feelings of fear. And um, I'll go on to this next quote now. We can also find the way in which bad smells can really, and I'm sure we'll learn this through our, through our smell walk, um, bad smells can really uh, characterize places very, very strongly for us. Um, and the visual can sometimes be displaced, the very strong sense of the visual, by other kinds um, of senses, such as olfactory and gustatory. So this is from Alain Corbin, Corbin's study uh, of French um, 18th century fear of the sexual <coughs> excrement in urban centers. Um, Thoreau noted that exposure to air and sunlight rendered the fecal matter spread out in the Montfaucon basins innocuous, as was proved by the transmutations in the smells. If old excrement proved dangerous, it's because it had become alien to ourselves, our food, and our furnishings by an interplay of decompositions and recompositions. It had lost the odor of the body. It had putrefied. We're typically attracted to things with pleasant odors and detracted from things with unpleasant odors. Sometimes the response is an immediate one. Some smells just are repugnant, such as the smell of almost anything decomposing, although autumn leaves could be a nostalgic 
exception. The negative value assigned to the source of the smell follows the immediate response. But we also judge olfactory experiences as negative because of our associations and what we know about their source. So the way in which knowledge feeds in and imagination too will feed into the experience. Decomposition is unpleasant and somewhat strange because it is associated with death and our fear of it as something to be avoided. A fear also played out in terms of a fear of the unknown. Uh, the expressive qualities and meanings of smells are part of the judgments we make about them and the environment in which we find them. In this way, smells, uh, everyday and not so everyday smells, um, play some role in determining our likes and dislikes and what we value in our environments. Okay, so that's, that's really the section of the paper trying to think about you know, smells as aesthetic objects, in particular smells as, as aesthetic objects and their significance within everyday contexts. Now let me move to trying to think about how we might classify bad smells. And here, my aim isn't just to try to think about where bad smells fit into these negative aesthetic categories, but also to try to capture some of the distinctions between the categories. Uh, and in that sense, a kind of more general exploration of negative, what might be called negative aesthetics. Uh, okay, so how do we understand the aesthetic disvalue of bad smells, which aesthetic category or all, and um, how might we capture the distinctions between them. Well, what about smells as ugly? Now, I don't think in terms of sort of normal conversation, we will often say, you know, oh, isn't that uh, exhaust smell ugly? I don't think in our normal terminology uh, we use it. I think ugliness tends to be a very visual term. Um, visually oriented term in terms of, of the way it's used in speech. But I do think, again, in terms of uh, thinking uh, theoretically, that ugliness is a very important and interesting category that can cover a whole set of, of the senses and different <coughs> kinds of um, sensory qualities, uh, including smells, including um, <coughs> uh, touch. So. Uh, Just this list, which I think I've borrowed from Frank Sibley um, from his nice paper on ugliness. Uh, it can be associated, ugliness can be associated with a whole set of qualities such as deformity, decay, disease, disfigurement, disorder, messiness, odd proportions, mutilation, uh, grating sounds, being defiled, spoiled, defaced, wounded, dirty, muddy, slimy, greasy, foul, putrid, and so on. In thinking through ugliness, we ought to embrace broad understanding as indicated uh, by some of the descriptions um, that I've just mentioned. Because beauty has been connected historically with order and harmony, many philosophers have identified ugliness with disorder and disharmony. For example, Rudolf Arnheim describes ugliness as, quote, a clash of uncoordinated orders when each of its parts has an order of its own but these orders do not fit together and thus the whole is fractured." End quote. While this approach captures the ugliness of disorder and in or incoherence, it is both too formal and too narrow, failing to capture the more disgusting type qualities, uh, such as the stench of rotting fish, that we might associate with the more extreme end of ugliness. Ugliness, like other aesthetic qualities, is accordingly, um, well, is, is response dependent. This is the kind of assumption I've been making really in, in talking about aesthetic experience, response and value um, in the talk. Um, so ugliness, you know, as part of an aesthetic judgment is, is dependent upon a value or valuing something. Undoubtedly, um, while we'll find agreement on, ugly, on ugliness across cultures, and I think we will, it will also vary both culturally and historically. Um, and I think smells probably can present some good examples of this. Some writers have also explored an evolutionary basis for our reactions to ugliness, but exploration of these ideas takes us you know, into many other realms, which I can't talk about here, like environmental psychology and anthropology. Suffice to say that when we're talking about cultural var variability around um, ugly or, or unappealing kinds of smells, there's going to be, there's, there's going to be cultural var variability. Um, now, based on these points about ugliness, I do think that bad smells would appear to fit the bill. They cause negative reactions. Uh, there can be negative feelings and emotions attached to uh, um, uh, bad smells, um, dislike, unpleasantness, 
uh, as opposed to pleasure, pleasantness, liking, which is often associated with positive aesthetic value. Um, and we've already established that generally, I think I've established at least, at least gone over some of the arguments, uh, that bad smells can be aesthetic objects in terms of being complex, stable, fragmented, but fragmented can still be okay, and so on. Perhaps most importantly, like other aesthetic objects with aesthetic disvalue, other kinds of ugly things, we can discern what it is that makes them unattractive. So we can apply relevant aesthetic concepts. Um, so what might be some of the relevant aesthetic concepts that can be applied to what I'm calling sort of ugly smells or, um, well, sour, putrid, um, I was trying to come up with, with a few, um, bitterness, um, a rotten, smelling rotten, uh, burning flesh smell, uh, polluted smell, smoky smell. Some smoky smells are okay. Some smoke, like wood smoke, people tend to find pleasant. Other kinds of smoky smells, they don't. Um, sweaty, uh, stagnant, old, musty, <laughs> sour smelling, um, exhaust-like. Another term I think that can move between the positive and negative is musky. So. Uh, Although, again, I think ugliness is not a term that we would tend to use in language or in speech. You know, that's an ugly smell, uh, or that's, just, you know, we tend to say, I think, disgusting more, and I'll say something about that in a moment. I do think that we use many of the kinds of terminology that we would associate with disvalue and therefore with ugliness in aesthetic terms, or in aesthetic in terms of theoretical discussions of ugliness. Okay, so what about disgusting? And that's my worst picture. I guarantee it. It's my worst picture. <laughs> I thought because it was sort of, you know, old and romantic looking, it wouldn't be so bad. I could have shown you much worse. <laughs> so, um, I want to start talking about disgust through uh, Menninghaus. Menninghaus has written a very good book on disgust that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And he has an interesting, I think, <coughs> quote about disgust. Um, he says, on the one hand, disgust comes to our attention in a particularly striking way and accordingly in no way escapes conscious perception. On the other hand, it attacks, it overcomes us, unannounced and uncontrollable, taking sudden possession of us. And I, I want to remember throughout my discussion of disgust this idea of taking sudden possession of us because I think dis uh, disgust is often um, considered to be equivalent to repulsion and therefore uh, not something that can enter the, the realm of aesthetic appreciability, but I'll, I'll try to defend disgust against that kind of point. I think disgust is, is the category we would most associate with strong or um, bad smells. Um, unlike ugliness, disgust is really conceived of, conceptualized as an emotion. Uh, when we talk about ugliness, it's really a kind of general aesthetic category that is uh, a term that's used a type of aesthetic judgment uh, that emerges between valuer and valued object. Disgust is, is discussed more as an emotion. It's been analyzed by psychologists as an emotion, for example. But I do think that we can talk about disgust uh, as an aesthetic concept too, not just an emotion, because we can talk about disgusting qualities. We can talk about the way we will talk about um, things that are, are really revolting or really unpleasant as having disgusting qualities. So in that sense, although I think, again, um, it's conceived of as an emotion, it, it certainly has this application to objects, and in that sense um, is more easily, I think, uh, brought into or brought alongside ugliness. I'll try to say something about how I conceive of the two in a minute. Um, uh, I also think that we tend to use the term disgust when we mean something less strong. I don't think I just said that, but we often use the term disgusting when we don't really mean something deeply repulsive. We might mean something that's just weakly disgusting or ugly if we were to use that term. So more weakly unpleasant. Uh, so again, I think we shouldn't be too distracted by the way it's used in ordinary language. Um, I would say that we could um, uh, think about disgust again properly is associated with much more stronger or intolerable kinds of smells. And um, in this sense, I would also want to say that disgust, even if it's associated with more stronger or intolerable smells, 
even with a, a degree of propulsion, um, it doesn't mean that we can't um, uh, involve, uh, that we can't make aesthetic judgments of disvalue. Uh, we can aesthetically attend to disgusting kinds of things. Now, it's often claimed that disgusting things um, are so overwhelming um, that attention to the object is either truncated or can never really get a, a foothold. So the aesthetic attention would somehow be impossible. So many would simply argue that the aesthetic response um, can't happen because there can't be any kind of sustained perceptual attention. And that uh, for that reason, disgust would have to be classified as a kind of visceral sensory action as opposed to a proper kind of aesthetic judgment. Certainly this is the case um, in some situations, uh, but I think uh, there are many situations in which something that's disgusting and not entirely repulsive on the very extreme end can involve aesthetic attention. Carolyn Korsmeyer uh, has defended disgust against that kind of claim, that it uh, is simply a mere sens uh, visceral sensory reaction. Um, she talks about, in, in her lovely paper on this, she talks about um, dis uh, kind of disgust in relation to particular kinds of meals, uh, food, uh, and tries to show how we don't simply cease appreciation, but that there's a lot of aesthetic attention that's going on. Uh, and that's partly why I wanted to sort of emphasize the idea of disgust have, taking a hold on us. I think there's a sense in which we assume that disgust means repulsion, that we just turn away. But disgust has, has a kind of way of, of um, uh, staying with us and uh, uh, penetrating us in some way, both physically and psychologically. Pleasant smells certainly um, are known to stick in our memories. There's a close uh, relationship between memory and olf the olfactory sense. So consider uh, the smell of a skunk. Now consider the smell of a skunk from a distance. Now, has everyone in the room smelled skunk before? Yeah, because I, because I, um, I know some Brits haven't, and uh, it's always interesting to just say, ah, that's the smell of skunk. Do you know that? No, I never smelled it. Um, but <clears throat> if you're smelling skunk from a distance, especially in the states, you can, you can. Uh, you know, it's an unpleasant smell, and you there's a, and that smell, you know, you're able to appreciate it in a sense, or to to sort of aesthetically appreciate it, not positive terms, but to appreciate it in some sense, to discern, make discernment of the smell, um, and you can do that from a distance. Uh, if you've never been sprayed directly, you can still imagine because you have knowledge. Normally, you have knowledge of how uh, awful being sprayed by a skunk directly is, and how difficult it is to get. Uh, the smell out, and all the ways in which people try to get the smell out. Um, and so, you know, even someone who hasn't been sprayed and smells it from a distance can have really quite, I think, a fairly complex and cognitively complex kind of experience of it, which may be mixed with fear too, emotions of fear in the sense that I hope that skunk isn't nearby, uh, and so on. Uh, so, I know people have been using Kane's term, cognitive penetration. Um, here I'll talk about uh, Jennifer Robinson's cognitive monitoring, the way in which cognitive mon monitoring can occur with bad smells or disgusting smells, so that again, we can understand smells as not just uh, bad smells and disgusting smells as not just a mere sensory reaction. Okay, I just wanted to finish um, this little section on, on disgust with I was trying to think about this a little bit. I'm going to get my other notes here. Um, I, th I have to admit, I'm a little, still a little bit sketchy on this, but where, do ugliness, where does disgust fit, fit with ugliness? I think what I want to say, um, and I really, again, trying to think about bad smells here, is that you can have, just like with beauty, you know, beauty has many forms as I would see it. It has um, sort of more what you call typical, pleasant, kind of easy beauty. You could have terrible beauty, which is something beautiful which is mixed with some tragic elements, and you can have grandeur, which is beauty, I would argue, on a grand, grand scale. With ugliness, you can also have um, a kind of spectrum where you might have weak ugliness, which is sort of plainness or dullness, as examples of, of aesthetic qualities associated with weak ugliness. Somewhere in the middle, you might have more what we call paradigm ugliness, something that's disordered or disfigured, diseased in some way, perhaps not I'm not sure about that. And then strong ugliness and disgust and repulsion at the kind of more extreme end. 
Whether or not disgust is a, is a uh, part of ugliness proper, I mean, I think I'd like to put it there. Repulsion of a very, very strong kind where you can't even uh, perceptually attend to something is just off the scale and, and wouldn't be part of, I would say, the category, aesthetic category of ugliness. So maybe weak, strong ugliness discussed sort of on the more extreme end, which would still fall under the general category, negative aesthetic category of ugliness. But repulsion where you can't attend, perhaps on the end. Anyway, that's my kind of current sketch. I'm not sure about that, but uh, it seemed when I was looking through the section that it wasn't very clear where, was, where everything was sitting, so I tried to do that to clarify it. Okay, what about the sublime? Um, why am I interested in smells of sublime? Well, because I've been working on the sublime, so <laughs> um, I'm going to end up saying that smells can't really be sublime, but um, because I've been working on the sublime, it's something I thought about. And also, Burke thought about it, and I think Burke said some interesting things about um, smells as a uh, bad smell <coughs> as a contender for sublimity. Smells and tastes, he says, have some share too in ideas of greatness, but it is a small one, weak in its nature and confined in its operations. I shall only observe that no smells or tastes can produce a grand sensation except excessive bitters and intolerable stenches. It is true that these affections of the smell and taste, when they are in their full force and lean directly upon the sensory, are simply painful, simply painful, and accompanied with no sort of delight. Okay, so <clears throat> um, Burke has offered, offers a really interesting um, set of comments, not very many, but interesting, I think, in the history of the sublime, um, uh, about smells. His detailed theory of the subjective passions, um, which is really quite characteristic of his treatment of the sublime, is matched by an equally detailed examination of its objective sources. It is an empirical theory. So we have the kind of typical sorts of qualities that cause the sublime, like terror and power, but also he talks about the senses. He talks about light, color, sound, and loudness, and also bitters and stenches. It's notable that Burke extends the sensory modalities associated with the sublime to include both smells and tastes, but he wasn't alone. Archibald Allison, later in the century, also talked about smells as sublime, but he didn't really have much to say about it. Burke's inclusion of smells and tastes is fairly unusual and could be seem odd given what we typically think about uh, as um, at the root of sublimity. But he doesn't end up allowing that much into the category. He includes only what he calls excessive bitters and intolerable stenches. And even these say, he says, have a, um, a small role and a weak effect. Uh, also, it appears that these olfactory extremes are sublime only if they're moderated. So actual stenches are just painful, like he said at the end of the quote, while literary descriptions would provide the correct or the uh, appropriate mediation or moderation required for genuine sublimity. And so he quotes Virgil here, uh, where the stench of vapor in Albunia conspires so happily with the sacred horror and gloominess of that prophetic forest. So um, why didn't Burke classify actual stenches, not just moderated through the arts, as sublime? Um, well, it's not surprising in a way, and there's another quote. He says, because some friends for whose judgment I have great deference were of opinion that if the sentiment stood nakedly by itself, it would be subject at first view to burlesque and ridicule. Asserting, basically associating smells and tastes with, quote, mean and contemptible ideas would degrade the sublime. So it's trying to remember that the sublime has both a terror and painful aspect, um, but also a, a very pleasant or, or um, less painful aspect. Not a delightful one for, for Burke, because his theory of sublimity was very dark, really. But uh, he, he, like others, um, didn't want to degrade the sublime and just, it wouldn't just be raw nature. It, would, it could still be nature itself, but it was often um, raw nature moderated through literary treatments or moderated through uh, the visual arts. Um, so I think that his, uh, his, his treatment is, is certainly relevant in terms of um, trying to uh, articulate how smells sometimes aren't just strong enough, but also how they may just be too painful or, or too disagreeable, perhaps just too repulsive to have any kind of appreciability. It's also interesting to note that, uh, that Burke does remark on the positive aesthetic value 
of smells and tastes, and the other senses is t too. So it does set up a contrast, and the term he uses to talk about beautiful smells t and tastes is smoothness. So. Okay, well I think Burke is right. Um, I think that um, ugly smells can share many of the features of the sublime, such as being overwhelming and jarring, uh, out of the ordinary, frightening. Uh, you know, the idea of an overwhelming stench, I think, is a very interesting one to think about in relation to the sublime, something that per is pervasive. And if you think again about the Menninghouse quote that I gave earlier, that it just comes upon you suddenly and takes hold uh, and, and is really overwhelming in that sense. Um, so I think, I think that, uh, you know, there are reasons why we might think about certain kinds of bad smells as sublime, but I don't think, after all, um, that they do uh, uh, capture or, or exhibit other kinds of features of the sublime. So there are some features, uh, certainly, and other features not. And I also just wanted to give you this interesting little picture by Jerry Coe, which I think you know, gives a really good example of the ways in which um, negative, more negative kinds of aesthetic qualities are, are beautified in the arts. And that was a very common idea in aesthetic theory in the 17th and 18th centuries, that, that you know, through the arts we can make beautiful something that would otherwise be disgusting or ugly. Uh, and why would we ever just want to present something as ugly or disgusting? Of course, we want to, to, to present something as beautiful. So here we have severed limbs, which you may react to in a pleasant way as opposed to a negative way, or you might think about the putrefying and the smell and so on, gangrene. Okay, so I'm keeping a, a bit of an eye on the time here, um, and I'm thinking about whether I will, I think I'm going to, I have a section here where I try to delve into a bit more the differences between sublimity and ugliness, and I can certainly speak to those a little bit more in, in discussion, but I think I'm gonna, gonna sort of get that, just summarize it quickly and go right on to um, what I think is really a more interesting contrast between sublimity and, and disgust in some way. Uh, so again, we can sh uh, ugliness shares with the sublime some of these features of being overwhelming, um, jarring, out of the ordinary, involving fear. But what we don't see is the kind of uplifting feelings that you get with the sublime and the way in which the sublime is, is typically characterized in many theories as a mixture of both negative and positive pleasure. Uh, we also don't find, I think typically in bad smells or ugly smells or disgusting smells, the kind of scale. Uh, the sublime, as I see it, is all about scale in relation to power and in relation to size. Now we can talk about the powerful stench of something but I think bad smells, there's a whole range of different kinds of bad smells that exhibit different kinds of qualities. And uh, uh, we don't tend to see scale as playing such a, an important role when we're talking about um, smells, I think. We can talk about weak and strong, but I'm, I'm not sure that's really going to capture the role that scale plays in sublimity. Okay. Um, I think I will say something, though, about, or try to say a little bit more, though, about um, the kind of existential force of, of sublimity versus ugliness and disgust. Now, although we can be fascinated, and I think deeply affected by ugly or disgusting smells, um, and quite seriously affected, uh, they're not commonly associated with metaphysical or transformative, transformative states of being in the way that the sublime is. Uh, disgust can involve insight and have existential force. I think, again, very strong kinds of bad smells can, if perhaps not on the same caliber or uh, the same kind of sublimity. So there may be some insight, and this is often uh, down to the intensity or effect of disgusting things, but I, I think it's <coughs> of, a, of a different kind. Um, and let me just give you some insight into that. Um, so fear is a factor belonging to aesthetic experiences of both disgust and the sublime, though the two are distinct. And here, uh, Carolyn Korsmeyer uses Burke's more terrible sublime for comparison. Sublimity, at least, involves revelatory experiences, while disgust, she contends, and I agree with her, is just deflationary in its tone. Her remarks nicely outline, I think, the ex existential level differences between sublimity and disgust. She says, terror is aroused by the natural upheavals, cosmic vastness, infinity itself, anything that signifies human powerlessness and possible annihilation. 
If that realization goes no further, we are only scared. If our attention manages to leave our own peril and become directed to the powerful forces at hand, we may be rewarded with the thrill and awe of the sublime. Death is realized differently in the experience of disgust. Here we have not the destructive sweep of mighty forces, but the dismemberment, putrefaction, or the slow and demeaning disintegration of individual bodies, even the most complex forms of which are eventually overtaken by hordes of proliferating microbes and vermin. Disgust apprehends not just destruction, but reduction of the noblest life to decaying organic matter in which all traces of individuality are obliterated. Okay, so I think she really nicely illustrates that there's meta metaphysical insight here, but that insight is very negative, lacking the excitement of sublimity and the sense in which we do not ultimately succumb to natural forces and processes. Sublimity is about feeling insignificant, but also feeling uplifted as a measure uh, to, to sublime forces. Through aesthetic encounters, the sublime and disgust do offer different glimpses into human nature, but one, I would say again, is ultimately uplifting and the other simply deflating. So given these kinds of differences, um, I would say that uh, sublimity, disgust, and ugliness diverge in various ways. Um, with sublimity, we have mild feelings of fearfulness, which may be evoked in response to overwhelming qualities, but it's usually from a safe place, uh, and there are uplifting feelings associated with the sublime, and so on. Okay, so hopefully that was a fairly brief run through the sublime, but I hope I've tried to try to illustrate where the differences occur. Let me just try to finish, really, with this slide, um, which is which is trying to get at the question I was asking Larry. I thought maybe Larry could give me the answer to this question. <laughs> uh, and I've struggled with it when, I, when I've written on ugliness, and that's that um, certainly um, disgusting and ugly smells can invite curiosity through their strangeness, especially when they're combined with interesting visual qualities. And here I have an example of, of um, a kind of hot springs with the sulfuric smells that will be coming from, from the kind of... Um, mud, the sort of uh, wet, uh, uh, the kinds of mud and all sorts of strange odors that you get in these sort of hot springs. I think this picture is from Iceland or something. Um, so we can take a kind of interest and fascination in things that we ascribe aesthetic disvalue to, to things that are ugly, to things that are disgusting. There's no question. Uh, tragedy, you know, is another kind of... Um, sort of uh, category within in negative aesthetics where you find this kind of, uh, you know, interest. And we know that Burke also wrote about that kind of strange interest that we might take in, in tragic or, or horrible or disgusting kinds of things. Um, and I, I, I'm not quite sure what I want to say here, except that I would, I would still argue that these are forms of disvalue, ugliness and, and disgust in relation to bad smell but that we can take a kind of interest or fascination in that, whether that turns the aesthetic value upwards in some way, or whether it just adds an element um, that's uh, less negative, uh, more engaged, a kind of interest and engagement, I think is probably the case. I'm not quite sure about it, but maybe you can help me with that. But what I would want to say is that unpleasant experiences of bad smells and other kinds of uh, bad experiences uh, can be very significant and meaningful and in some ways edifying for us. So just a, a few points of conclusion and I think I'll just end there. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm a bit confused and I was, I was wondering if you, maybe you could just clear up, up something. So I'm confused a bit about the relation between the ugly and the disgusting. I think because you, you, talked, you talked about sort of disgust and the ugly I got a bit confused because I guess disgust is a reaction, but mm -hmm. ugly isn't a reaction. It's a mm -hmm. thing we attribute to objects. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, well, what's the what's the analogy or the similarity supposed to be? Mm -hmm. So, so disgust is a is a physiological reaction we have, mm -hmm. and the best that we can characterize the object of that that reaction is just in terms of the disgusting. I mean, it's really just a response dependent kind of concept. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, well, what are our reactions? to the ugly. I mean, what's the equivalent of the reaction of disgust to the ugly? Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure of the answer to that because there's an important distinction, I guess, between aesthetic values and disvalues and the reactions we have towards those values and disvalues. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems that we could, we could have an object that we think of as ugly for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can give reasons for its ugliness, but we could react with pleasure towards it if we're so inclined, or we could act 
react with interest or fascination. Mm -hmm. Towards the disgusting, if, the, if you're talking about the disgusting object, well, we can maybe react with lots of things as well, including disgust. Mm -hmm. Then I'm, I'm not really. I'm, you say I'm just not sure exactly what you want to say about this connection between the ugly mm -hmm. and the disgusting in terms of aesthetic interest. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't see any reason why we couldn't take aesthetic interest in the disgusting, but that wouldn't have any effect on the way in which we should think of the disgust we feel towards it. Mm -hmm. So maybe what you wanted to say was just something like, well, sometimes disgust is so overwhelming that we can't feel anything else towards it because we just can't pay the kind of attention required mm -hmm. for for aesthetic interest. Mm -hmm. um, but then you could say that about some aesthetic pleasures as well, I, su I suppose. Mm -hmm. So then it would just be, is it just then a claim about the amount of attention that can be, that can be paid to an object given um, how strong the reaction we have towards mm -hmm. it is, mm -hmm. and the disgust is a nice mm -hmm. example of that. Mm -hmm. It's just a question for clarification. No, I think it's a good question, and I think that's why I was trying a little bit to sketch it out, because I realized it also wasn't very clear. Um, I think a lot of the question is turning on, you know, again, the, the fact that the aesthetic is so much, you know, a judgment, as I see it, arising from this a relationship between the subject and the object, from the experiencing subject, the valuer, and the object. And I think disgust, where is disgust located? Where it's a psychological reaction, it's considered an emotion as well, the psychologist. So it's, you know, it's, I think it is, it, 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 there's no question that it's conceptualized, at least, as located in the subject, okay? But I, what I want to say is that if we're trying to put together an aesthetic sort of theory of disgust, I'd want to say that, yes, it's a reaction, and we can talk about it not just as a psychological or emotional reaction, but also as an aesthetic reaction. And how can we do that? We can do that by talking about disgusting qualities. And what would those disgusting qualities be? Well, those disgusting qualities would be, I think, played out by the more extreme end of what we call ugly qualities, like putrid, diseased, um, uh, what were some of the other ones I've given, like a strong, bitter, you know, so something on the more strong end of ugly qualities. Okay, with ugliness, which is, I, I'm, I'm, I'm calling this kind of larger category, um, theorizing is this larger category, we don't feel ugly, we don't have ugly reactions, but there are ugly things and ugly qualities. And the kinds of emotional uh, or just uh, felt reactions we have, which we would call aesthetic, are dislike, negative on the just on just more simple kinds of experiences of dislike just as we would say in contrast to the pleasant. I just have a, a yeah. so so just to get clear so when we have disgust towards objects whatever they are so you want do you want to say uh, disgust itself is it can be an aesthetic reaction in context where we take an aesthetic interest in the disgustingness of the objects or do you just want to say that um, even if we find an object disgusting, it can still allow for aesthetic attention or interest to be paid. Because I wasn't quite clear whether you thought yeah, of disgust I itself as an aesthetic response. Right, 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 right. Uh, I don't want to say disgust is, well, that's a good question. Do I want to say, dis I think you're really asking me to say, is disgust always an aesthetic reaction? Yeah, and you, presumably you don't want to say that because no. then any reaction you might as well just call aesthetic. No, you know, no, no, you're right. Yeah, and that's a, that's a really good point. And I suppose that's partly why I was sort of getting to, you know, the repulsion thing is, you know, one way in which we're going to say disgust isn't always an aesthetic reaction because it's just turning away. But yeah, no, that's a real, that's a, I think a very useful point. Thank you. Um. I wanted to ask you about um, a couple of the smells that you had on your initial list of bad smells that um, that are not what well, we, we kind of have sometimes a positive and negative reaction mm -hmm. to them, like the Limburger cheese, or maybe mm -hmm. there's a Spanish cheese which isn't quite as bad. I think it's called Cabrales. Cabrales. <laughs> it's a little bit nicer. Than that. <laughs> and um, or or um, the body smell of someone who's been exercising a lot but is a, basically a healthy person. We can have a kind of a mixed. Um, reaction to that, and I don't, I was thinking about it in connection with Sublime in, in a sense that these kind of experiences remind us of our corporeal nature and the kind of the disgustingness of our physical selves, but at the same time, there's a kind of, um, the positive side indicates some sort of overcoming of that or the joy of life despite that, but I don't know if Sublime is the right word for, to use in the kind of context of these but you can, we can have quite strong aesthetic reactions, I think, in a mixed sense. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I suppose I'm, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, they're going to, they're sort, yeah, so I think I, I, I'm just kind of trying to analyze this. I think there can be, uh, there can be a situation where you just have different preferences, different kinds of, you know, reactions. Some really don't like Limburger cheese, others think it's okay. And then you're going to have the same person, same object having a mixed reaction, yeah. yeah. Um, and I, th I certainly think, I mean, I can just use kind of ugliness as, as, a, as a sort of, I'm, I'm not sure this is quite what you had in mind if you think about like a crow. You know, a crow, you could say a crow is it can be quite attractive, you know, it's black and maybe it's not as bright in color, but it still has a sleekness to it, but that its call is, relatively speaking, an unattractive sort of bird song. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can see in the same object, you could have different kinds of qualities, which are giving you a kind of mix. But I think that's, I'm not <coughs> sure if that's quite the example you had in mind. Is it more that you could see bodily sweat as a representation or a symbol of, of, of health, or is just, yeah, yeah. yeah. With the crow, it's more two things side by side, yeah. but the yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I suppose there, I'd say yes, we can have um, reactions of that kind, a response of that kind. Would I then say they would bring it more closer to the category of the sublime? Possibly, but I think we'd still worry about the scale issue, which I think is quite important. Um, but it's a good question whether a really, really strong smell like. Yeah, I'd have to think a little bit more about that. Um, should we, maybe follow, are we following up or something? Um, yes, relating to that, um, I was very interested in this distinction between good and bad smells as well. It's something I have to deal with a lot in my work and have carried out yeah. surveys and asked people to list their most five favourite smells and their most five least mm -hmm. favourite smells. And it's incredible how the sm same smells mm. come up on <coughs> both lists. You know, and so perfumes, for example, is something that appears quite frequently on least favourite smells because mm -hmm. it's specific perfumes, mm -hmm. um, and they would be co considered by many people as bad smells. Likewise, the cheese example is listed by some people as the least favourite. Body odour, again, is one that's listed as, um, I think 55% of the people in my survey listed body odour as one of their least five favourite mm. odours, whereas 10% listed it as one of their most favourite odours, <laughs> because it depends who, whose body it comes from, and that comes up time and time again sure. in research sure. on body odour. Yeah. Um, so the position I've always taken in my research is that there are no good or bad smells. It all mm -hmm. depends on the associations mm -hmm. we attach to them, mm -hmm. that we're kind of born with no preferences apart from trigeminal smells that, you know, tickle our trigeminal nerves, such as mm -hmm. the top, potentially toxic smells. Mm -hmm. But again, as we grow older, we can grow to love or hate those. Some people list at five trigeminal smells as their mm -hmm. most favourite smells. Mm -hmm. um, but what um, I suppose my comment question comes round to is when I've been doing research in um, different places and investigating people's different perceptions of smells according to context, I found that the context is what determines whether a smell is good or bad, mm -hmm. not the smell itself, any characteristics as though the smell itself is neutral, it's the context that changes it. Mm -hmm. So some people who've listed the smell of fish as one of their least five favourite mm -hmm. smells I can then take them into a fish market and they can actually enjoy the smell of the mm -hmm. fish market. They can gravitate towards them and it mm -hmm. can add to their place experience. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I don't know if that, um, yeah. if you've got yeah. a, a, a take on all that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't have a sort of psychological kind of knowledge about smells and empirical knowledge of smells in this paper or in the other paper really. But certainly in the earlier paper, I do talk a lot about the role that context plays in smells and how important it can be, you know, and I mentioned um, that, you know, the certain smells of one's partner can be much more attractive than they might be to a stranger and so on. So, so I think, yes, I do think context is important. Whether I would claim there are no, no bad smells, I think I'd probably want to resist that claim, <laughs> even if the, some of the empirical evidence might show it. And that's because I think, as someone who works on aesthetic theory, I, I want to say that once you start removing certain kinds of things like personal biases, that you can get to, you can't get to objectivity, but you can get to a kind of intersubjectivity where you can find agreement on certain things. And you know, maybe your evidence shows that it's never the case, but I think I'd like to think that's the case because that's part of the argument I'm gonna make that, that bad smells are proper aesthetic objects. And as such, on my view, they can be the objects of aesthetic judgment for which we can give our reasons. They're not just preferences, yeah. I mean, I think preferences probably play a greater role, 
in smells than in other kinds, of, perhaps, than in other kinds of um, uh, aesthetic objects, but and more cultural variability. I, I don't, I don't know again. I, but uh, I, I wouldn't want to say there are no sense. No. Yes, well, uh, thank you very much. It's really interesting. Um, there's something, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out this distinction between uh, ugliness and disgust. And mm -hmm. um, returning to uh, like the question of feminist aesthetics and, mm -hmm. and philosophy, um, there's this um, uh, aspect, I think that Korsmer talks about elsewhere, um, about um, the senses, the body, um, relationship being part of like a feminist aesthetic um, project. And um, there's, there's something about ugliness that seems to fall within the purview of the visual mm -hmm. and visualist aesthetics, this idea of kind of um, somehow a contained distanced object um, that you look at as object. Mm -hmm. Whereas disgust is sort of more, I mean, this is really being generalizing, but just for the sake of argument, um, in, the, in the perceiver. So it's more in the subject, in the subjective mm -hmm. response to something. And it's felt viscerally, sort of like a falling, you know, uh, uh, awareness of like, this is just disgusting. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess um, it's more of a comment, but mm -hmm. I think maybe um, the question would be um, around questions of, of embodiment um, as these you know, pertain to ugliness and um, disgust. And do, like, do you intend them to be sort of dis distinct or are they more continuous? Um, on how does um, perhaps a uh, multi-sensorial mode of analysis enable um, you to um, uh, explore disgust? I think mm -hmm. that disgust is perhaps more interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I get. I mean, I, 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 I hope I sort of answer that question when I answer Kane's question, where, where I, and, and I think I. I'm still not, you know, I haven't done a lot of thinking about the distinction between ugliness and disgust, and I was trying to do it, you know, a bit more before um, speaking. But I, I guess what I'd say is that I think ugliness is a neglected aesthetic category, and that it is associated with the visual, uh, typically, and it is associated, yes, rightly, with qualities. But I just think disgust is pretty narrow. I think ugliness captures a whole range of unpleasant aesthetic experiences that are really worth exploring, and that we can sort of move away from its visual sort of uh, emphasis, which I think is right, um, to just, and I've written a paper on ugliness, which is really in the context of environmental aesthetics. And, um, but if you just look, look at the list that Sibley offers that I sort of borrow from him, he, it's a whole range of sensory categories coming into those aesthetic concepts, I think, that aren't just visual. So I think it's, I, I suppose I want to hang on to ugliness as this sort of uber category. I, I have no problem with these old, I think they're really useful 18th century categories of the beautiful, the sublime, the picturesque, and the ugly. I think they're really useful. And of course we have to add on to them a whole set that we've now explored in aesthetics, like humor and horror more, more so, and so on. And, the marvelous and whatever else, but I think they're still very useful. And so I think, I guess it's a kind of just a pet project of mine to really try to explore ugliness and to see where things fit. So I, although I, again, I don't think it works in ordinary language, ugly smell, I think theoretically smells can be ugly <laughs> in that sense, yeah. So. Uh, your question about the sublime mm -hmm. made me think on Adorno. Uh, Adorno. I know this is a different philosophical tradition, but uh, Adorno has a book, uh, Negative, uh, Negative Dialectics, uh, where he says that very bad smells like smells of putrefaction or death or these kind of things can awake philosophical questions about what is life, what is death, uh, there is any possible of other future life after death or some this kind of metaphysical questions. Uh, so perhaps this has uh, a kind of relation with this question about if a bad smell can be sublime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, and I, I mean, I agree that, that, that um, particular, like smells of death and putrefaction certainly have existential force, <laughs> no question. And you could also argue that 
pollution has a kind of existential force because, you know, to us it symbolizes the degradation of the environment. You know, you can talk about the kind of meanings that relate to, to bad smells and in, in a kind of existential way. But I suppose I, I think I need to look at Adorno. I think that's a really interesting point and it fills it out, that claim. But I think it's, what I would probably say is it relates to profundity and has this deflation, can have the deflationary tone because the way you're presenting it sounds like it could just be profound kinds of thoughts and, and not just deflationary. And I make, in my work on the slime, I make a distinction between profundity and sublimity. Um, and not everyone's going to buy it, <laughs> but one of the claims I make is that sublimity, it, it really is a very particular kind of metaphysical, you know, a very Kantian kind of metaphysical um, point. <laughs> and profundity is just more about kind of serious, heavy kinds of existential thoughts, whereas sublimity is a much more specific move between the man, humbling feeling and then the feeling, but also feeling significant, a measure, as it were. So that's probably how I respond to it. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I, I guess if you're going to stick within Kant's uh, conceptual structure, bad smells are never going to make it. No, I'm, I'm not arguing that Kant so, would make that claim. I'm yeah. not making the argument. No, I know, I know. <laughs> but uh, I mean, it's no surprise that you would come to that conclusion. Um, uh, one thing I want to get straight uh, so positive smells could be sublime? Um, I haven't thought about that, actually. I haven't thought about that. Um, I haven't thought, I haven't given it any thought, actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> I will, though. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think the, the subject, subjective nature of smells uh, kind of um, eliminates the possibility of universality, mm -hmm. uh, even with bad smells. The U.S. Army tried to create a, a stink bomb, a stench, stench bomb, uh, that would uh, be universally uh, dislikable uh, and failed mm -hmm. because of precisely the reasons that Victoria mentioned and other things. Context means a lot of things. Cultural conditioning affects how people of different cultures uh, relate to scents. And so, you know, I don't think you're going to achieve a universal. I'm not, I, uh, I didn't make, didn't yeah, make that or claim. Even, or even, yeah. I, well, the claim I made was intersubjectivity. Yeah, and that was but even, in my response to Victoria, I'm not making any. But even point. agreement, even broad common sense agreement, um, uh, at least interculturally. Okay. But um, yeah, I guess the thing is, um, to what uh, I, I'm a little bit surprised in a way, you know, given that you you've been involved with with everyday aesthetics, that mm -hmm. now you're just operating on a kind of aesthetic discursive level, because if you look at everyday aesthetics are examples of people who have been, um, have found revelations in bad smells. In my book, Smell Culture Reader, uh, there's some examples in the final chapter um, with um, people who have experienced uh, near-death experience, near death experiences, olfactory experiences of loved ones that uh, have not, of some pleasant smells, but also mm -hmm. some negative smells that mm -hmm. have been revelatory. Mm -hmm. And um, again, I, I don't want to. I don't want to say you can't have profound or serious kinds of existential sorts of responses. I, I'm just not putting it on the on, on the. I make a very specific point about sublimity. So I'm not saying they don't have existential force. Yeah, but if sublimity is the, only defined by Kant, if that's the only definition, then it's not the only definition. It's a very strong 18th century claim about the kind of way in which the mind is elevated, and I have very specific points I make about that. The mind but, is elevated. But the sublime has also been redefined and reconceptualized since then too. You know, over 200 years. So I, I've written a book on it. I know. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, <laughs> what I'm trying so I'm to say, what I'm trying to say, is that that I have a particular theory of the sublime. It's not merely Kantian. Um, but I, what I want to say, I mean, I thought that the Korsmeyer quote quite nicely illustrated the very great significance that the smell of death can have, existentially. But I don't want to say it's sublimity. So that's all. So I'm not, I'm not denying the existential force at all of very strong smells, or denying that people could have something called a revelatory experience, which could be associated with what I would say is associated with profundity. So, you know, I think we're going to differ on our, our understandings of the sublime, 
certainly. There's no question. A lot of people are going to disagree with the theory of the sublime I put forward in the book. I'm not denying that. But I'm, I'm not denying that there's a kind of seriousness or profundity or, 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 or some kind of revelatory experience that can be attached to some very strong smells. That's all. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, this, is, this topic is not my speciality, but today is the first time I explore smell as a possibility for aesthetic experience, and it's been very interesting. But tell me, I want to know if I am like on the right way, because I think um, this uh, experience depends on your idea of art, whether you think that art is only the, the try to find beauty for the sake of it, or if you think that art can lead you to other things, such as philosophical reflection, political reflection. So, so many, I think many, I suppose many philosophers would say that this is use art, and art shouldn't be used. But for example, I think that the smell of fear, or the smell of war, or the smell of, it, it inspires you. For example, I remember once I entered a museum, which was about a war that happened somewhere, and when I and when I entered, as, um, I saw lots of skeletons and skulls, and this you could smell the the smell of death of dead people. And at that moment, I like try. I, I was in the mood to. I was like in this uh, environment of what happened there and all these dead people. So this smell, mm, you know, inspired me to to think about that. So I think that if you if you accept that art is more than just beauty for the sake of it, you can think that it can have a political use or, or uh, it can have a, a, a um, it can inspire you, uh, it can inspire a philosophical reflection. Some people just may do it for, for cur out of curiosity, just because it's, they are, it's interesting, mm, they don't go further into reflecting. Um, also, I think it's very important that you enjoy Mm, uh, nice smells because uh, you are using a sense which has been quite neglected. You know, we, we people know perfumes and that's it. So what they, people don't explore into that. But I think that when when you try to say to people that you can have an aesthetics of bad smells of, or ugly smells, then people is going to say, what for? Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to find like why. <laughs> okay, first of all, some people might find ugly uh, beauty in it, maybe. Another thing is what I said, political, um, political, philosophical, scientific, also scientific knowledge, because it helps you, uh, for example, the smells of plants, the smells of animals, mm -hmm. it also helps you know uh, things from another point of view. So I don't know whether this is a very, how should I put it, a very um, pragmatic, pragmatist view of art, but for me, I like it. I don't know if I'm wrong. Yeah. No, I, I think um, I'm very sympathetic to, to the role of aesthetics, you know, that it can feed into, you know, the good life or just to, to kind of some of the points I made about so the edifying aspects of, of what I call negative aesthetics, uh, the educative aspects of negative aesthetics. Um, it's not really my business, as it were, to go in and examine you know exactly how that plays out, um, but there has been a lot of interesting discussion around more more negative aesthetic categories such as tragedy. It's probably the, the largest literature, at least in aesthetics, which looks at kind of uh, ways in which a more difficult or challenging kinds of aesthetic experience can um, uh, increase our emotional range, enable us to experience quite difficult uh, kinds of things in ways that are directly harmful to ourselves. Uh, how does that play out outside the arts in sort of more everyday aesthetics or in environmental aesthetics? Well, I think you know, usually if you're in a safe place, if you're in, you have the luxury of, of aesthetically attending to something that's very unpleasant without being deeply or negatively affected by it in certain kinds of ways. Um, so, so yes, I would, I would agree with you that, um, you know, I guess, I suppose you're saying why, you know, why would people bother? Well, I suppose I'd, I'd say just trot out the argument that people make around tragedy that, you know, why, you know, the paradox of tragedy, the paradox of horror, the paradox of ugliness, the paradox of the sublime, which is why would people take part in, in negative aesthetic experiences in the first place? Why would they seek them out? Uh, and I think it's because um, the, the most convincing answer I found is that it's, 
these experiences are edifying, that they matter to us. They just matter. Um, and because of they, for all sorts of reasons, like increasing our emotional range, uh, increasing significance or understanding uh, diversity of meaning in our environment, not just the pleasant or the kind of more hedonistic um, uh, kinds of experiences. Yeah.